We are just letting Emily get the live stream up onto the website and then I will call us to order. <clears throat> oh, we're good. All right. I will call the meeting to order at 7.02. Welcome everyone. We will move straight on to commendations. Does anybody have any commendations? I believe John, would you like to kick it off? You've got some? I do. Can everyone hear me? So each year, the uh, State uh, Superintendents Association, the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents, uh, give superintendents an opportunity to honor graduating uh, seniors in the uh, high school class. And tonight, I have two Marblehead High School seniors uh, that I will be uh, recognizing with this honor from the State Superintendents Association uh, based on the recommendation of Mr. Bauer, the high school principal. And the first student is Katie Kowalski. Uh, Katie is a member of the National Honor Society, the French Honor Society, the Tri Music Honor Society, Vice President of the Interact Club, Chairperson of the Student Council, member of the National Green Honor Society and a service coordinator, a member of the Jewel Tones, and a peer mentor who Mr. Bauer says is incredibly helpful giving tours to incoming freshmen prior to the start of school. So it's my pleasure to recognize Katie tonight and I'll ask her to unmute herself and maybe say uh, a couple things about her plans for post Marblehead High School. Katie. Hi, um, so uh, for my plans, thank you first of all for uh, considering me for this award and um, I'm so grateful to be receiving it um, for plans after high school i plan on attending college i'm not sure yet where but um but for sure going to college awesome katie congratulations we're happy to recognize you this Thank evening you. the other student is nicholas Thibodeau, and he is a member of the national honor society a member of the spanish honor society a math uh, honor society member he's a member of the math team a core peer mentor who mr bauer notes helped with the organization and implementation of the peer mentor program. He's the varsity sailing team captain, varsity sailing, soccer, and indoor track, and a sailing instructor at the Yacht Club. So it's our pleasure to recognize uh, Nicholas Thibodeau, and we'll ask him to unmute and talk about future plans after Marblehead High School. Oh, I think you're muted still. Um, thank you so much. I'm not sure uh, where I'd like to attend college, but similar to Katie, I, uh, I would like to attend college after high school. Awesome. Well, congratulations, Nick. Congra congratulations, Katie. And we have your certificates over at Widger Road, and I will drop them off tomorrow uh, at Marblehead High School for you. That's uh, quite the resume you both have. So congratulations. Well done. Very impressive. Congratulations to both of you. Best of luck as you move through senior year and uh, on to whatever college that, that your process ends you with. Anybody else have any commendations this evening? Meg? Well, I'll do it. Um, it's not to anyone in particular, but really everyone on the building committee, everyone who works at the Brown School and had something to do, you know, helped out with not only the building project, but also with the event that we had on Sunday, because um, 
it was really quite a special day. And I think everyone who's had a hand in that deserves a big congratulations and congratulations to the students and families who have done a great job um, transitioning into that new school with drop off and pick up and the teachers obviously who went above and beyond getting that school ready for them. So just a job well done all around. Absolutely agreed. Thanks, Megan. Anybody else this evening? Yeah, I'll just second that. And Abby Lewis and Cindy Schieffer led up the charge for the uh, ribbon cutting event with some help from Gilbane and Left Field. But yeah, it couldn't have gone off better. It was a beautiful day. Um, it was it was great going through the school and um, hearing the students practicing their music and this land is your land. And um, yeah, it just couldn't have been a better better event to, uh, you know, kick things off, so. Absolutely. All right, um, that will move us on to our student representative, Yasin Colon. Yasin, welcome tonight. What do you have on tap for us? Hey, thank you. Um, not a super ton this week, but we still have some stuff. We had positive feedback from our day zero on October 13th. Just a reminder, the freshmen had day of service, sophomores and juniors had the PSAT, and seniors had college visits and workshops. The math meet, math, excuse me, the math team won their first meet on October 7th. Uh, with the Brown School, as I'm sure you all know, uh, the first day for them was October 13th, and they had a ribbon cutting ceremony on the 17th. And the freshmen helped out the, at the Brown School on the day of service, which is also pretty cool. Uh, the PCO had a meeting October 18th. Freshman class officers had their first meeting yesterday after their elections. The first day of pool testing was today for Marblehead High School, so that's pretty exciting as well, just seeing where we're at with COVID and how far we've come. Uh, the NGSS, or the National Green School Society, officers led a cleanup with kids at Village School today. That's pretty cool. The senior class picked their powder puff captains and they're continuing to work on their fall events. Um, all of the classes chose costumes for Halloween, so hopefully we'll see some pretty cool costumes. Uh, the junior class clothing and powder puff clothing is coming out next week. And our all sports booster scholarship drive is this Sunday from one to, excuse me, from 12 to three. And as far as sports, Girls soccer and field hockey had their seniors nights last night. So congratulations to seniors. Um, girls soccer won last night and volleyball also beat Masco last night. Wonderful. Thanks, Yasin. Always a lot going on over there. Um, any, can you clue us into what those uh, costumes, uh, it sounds like they're themes that, that yes. are per class? I can. So the freshman class is country versus country club. So some will dress up as country and some will dress up as country club. Um, the sophomores are doing 80s neon. So that's pretty interesting. Um, the junior class is doing ancient Greeks. So we're all gonna be wearing togas. And the senior class are doing characters and celebrities from the 2000s. Love it. <laughs> thank you, Yasin. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, all right, that will move us along to our public comment. If anyone wants to make public comment, please use the raise hand function. Um, we will allow for three minutes per person. Um, and if you will please remember to state your name and address for the record as well. All right, I don't have any hands up. Um, so I will continue to move us through our agenda. Um, next up are minutes. Um, I know one set was dropped in um, quite late, so I'm not sure we may need to table um, the 429. Um, I will just kind of put it out there immediately because we'll probably reference it a few times tonight. The, our, our next meeting is actually going to be next Thursday um, because the first meeting of November falls on the weekend or the days of the um, Massachusetts Superintendent and School Committee uh, state conference. So we're going to move that up. Um, I think next Thursday is the 28th. So there'll be no meeting on the 4th, and there will be a meeting on the 28th of October. So we will 
we can punt the 429 minutes to that. Does anyone feel strongly either way about the 415 minutes? Do you want to punt those two? Uh, if there's no objection, I would like to push them both to next week. Sure. I, I would as well. Okay, um, that's fine. I just want to refresh my memory. The, our only meeting in November will be the 18th then? That is correct as of right now. Yep. Okay. Unless some other meeting needs to get added for whatever. But I'm going to try really hard for just that 18th. I'm holding you to that. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> All right. So we will table those and move them to next week. Thanks, everyone. Um, John, that leads us to our superintendent report. I have uh, Dan Bauer up first. Is that how you'd like to start? Can I, can I just really quickly ask, do you mind, does anybody, is anybody opposed to getting those minutes up in draft version at least? That's fine. And and the and as you always with all of our meetings, they're on the YouTube channel too in their in okay. full. All right, perfect. Thanks. Yes, the committee had uh had wanted uh Principal Bauer to come back and give you an update on the day of service and it was very successful. So I know Dan is eager to tell you uh about the day uh day zero update. Easy for me to say. <laughs> Thank you, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to come back. Um, before I begin, though, I'm so pleased uh, Nick and Katie just they're just um, just awesome students, awesome everything involved, everything that you would want in a Marblehead High School student, and um, they just day in and day out they lead by example. So it's nice to see them recognized. Uh, they're both very humble, so I'm glad they had a chance to come on and talk. So it was nice. Um, Yasin does a great job, I guess. Now I didn't know Toga Day was coming, so. Be prepared for that, so we'll make it work. <laughs> anyway, yes, day zero was a success. Um, I'm very proud of our staff, and I'm very proud of our students because we put the plan together. Uh, we knew it would be a little bit messy in some regards, but at the end of the day, the feedback was very positive from our staff, and we did some surveys with our students for all three uh, components, which was a day of service for grade nine, PSAT test for grade 10 and 11, and the college visit slash essay workshop for our grade 12 students. Um, so I'll start with the day of service. Um, we, we surveyed our teachers, our site managers, as well as our students. The overall, I'll start with the site managers. We had over 13 sites, uh, including our schools, new sites as a police station, fire department, back to Devereaux Beach um, and Gold Lake Reservation. We had Spur in the building working, making dog biscuits for the Northeast Animal Shelter, which was a hit. 100% uh, said they would do the day of service again. Uh, all their feedback was our students were outstanding, enthusiastic, uh, and just did a great job. And, and that was really good to hear as principal. Uh, in terms of the engagement, we asked how they felt the students were engaged. And it was a high rate. We did a one to 10 uh, scale. So the 100% eight and above, uh, to me, that's outstanding. Uh, in terms, we also asked, was there enough time available because we used really 8.15, 8.30 until 11 when they came back for lunch at 11.30 and 75% felt there was enough time for the projects. We surveyed our teachers and they felt the students were engaged. Uh, of 7 to 10, 78% said so, which was really, which was good. Um, in terms, one of the pieces that we need to work on for next year, and I think it's just a component not doing it for a couple of years, just working with our sites to balance out to make sure there is enough time because some of the feedback from some sites is 50-50. Some said too much time, some said not quite enough time. So we'll work with our sites on that uh, for feedback in advance with a little more time. In fact, we probably would connect doing this again next year with our sites in the spring just to work on things for the fall. In terms of the students, I think the biggest piece uh, was 78% Felt very strongly about doing the day of service, enthusiastic about it again. So that's very positive feedback. Uh, we did not group students according to their preference with sites. We just, we just assigned them because of timing as well as our grade nine homeroom teachers. So some of the feedback to look for in the future would be, you know, providing opportunities for students to choose the site, at least give them up. We've done that before. Uh, and now with our MyFlex learning that we've developed and utilized for Magic Block, we use that for the day of service. So we feel we could do that more effectively next year and provide more opportunities for students to learn about the sites. Um, and, and that will only uh, improve the day of service. So overall, I would say a thumbs up by all. And, you know, at the end of the day, very proud of how they work with our community. 
the PSATs uh, was a success as well. We had 404 test takers um, and we provided a great testing environment for them. Uh, what I was encouraged as principal is that test takers who might not ordinarily, for whatever reason, not take the PSAT, took the PSAT. So they were provided with an experience for a standardized high pressure stakes test. Uh, but also at the end of the day, only, only 35 opted out. So it was a very small number. So we surveyed parents, 87.8% uh, said, yes, we'd like to, we would prefer to have it on Wednesday during the school. Students, it was 96.3% said they would, yes, prefer to have it on a Wednesday. So to me, the, the data speaks for itself. We put the Google survey out uh, last week, at the end of last week. Um, so I think that's very, very strong. We have some suggestions for feedback to improve the testing uh, because we would like to do that again next year. And we're looking forward to providing more feedback for our students. They get test booklets and, the, and I think that's important piece so that they can cross check the results because they took it in school and we'll be working with the students when the results come back. The last component was the college visit and college essay. So we allowed students and families to take a college visit. We would excuse the absence and allow participation in extracurriculars or they can come to the high school and work with their English teachers on their college essays and have a workshop with the common application. So we asked the same thing in terms of the visit um, and this survey went out late. So we didn't have as many, uh, as much data, but I think the early data shows a very favorable uh, reception for the college visit with 90% 90, 90 said, yes, uh, they, would, they would prefer, they would do that again. We asked the parents in terms of the essay, was it time well spent? Not sure or no. 67.9 uh, said yes, time well spent. 21.4 said not sure. So that to me tells maybe the seniors aren't talking to the parents with details about things and that sometimes happens. So that's a high percent. We asked the students if the, the college visit was valuable time, 95.7% said yes. And in terms of the essay, 66.7 said yes, it was valuable time. And again, 28.2 said not sure. So to me, um, that all makes sense. So I would say that was a, definitely a, a positive thumbs up. Um, in terms of improvements for next year, if we can continue this. So the essay workshop uh, is something that we discovered that we need to provide options for students in advance so we can group them accordingly. Because we find some students, they haven't started their essay up to just a few revisions and tweaks. Um, and in, everything in between. So we could categorize and that would really help the students when they come in to pinpoint what the teachers could work with the students. So we know that moving ahead and we'll advertise that sooner. Also for the college visits, if we're able to do this again next year, we would advertise in the spring that we're doing this for our junior students so families can plan accordingly. That was a nice buffer. And as we know, travel is definitely more confusing and crazy than it was pre-pandemic. Uh, but families like to take it in, in, you know, the geographical grouping of schools and that helps for organizations. So having that advance notice will help our families. And that was some great feedback we received. So I would say all three components, um, I would recommend strongly to do this again. It provided a nice buffer and break if we're looking at SEL for our students, for our staff and for families. And at the same time, it provided a very valuable service and we're really curious to see the PSAT data as we work with our students. Um, part of the recommendations too was that um, things to do better is there was recommendations to take a look at, could that possibly be a half day and tie that in with, you know, again, this is a lot, I don't wanna put the cart before the horse and we have to work through things, but utilizing a half day for that where we could start the PSATs a little bit later provide a buffer for organization. And that way the students, when they're done with the PSATs, quite frankly, it was like the MCAS. They were really kind of done. You know, they were exhausted mentally uh, from that. And the college visits, if you're teaching a senior class, you know, it was very few students in those classes, for example, AP Gov or uh, AP Calculus. Um, so at the end of the day, that's something maybe we could look at with an early release in December and moving that over, because I think that would benefit our staff to tie in that long professional development day on a Tuesday and wrap things up on a Wednesday. Again, I don't wanna promise something that I can't deliver or put the cart before the horse, but those were great recommendations from our staff. And I think that makes a lot of sense. I do have to thank a number of people. Our staff was outstanding and made it work and happen. 
I want to thank you for the parents and guardians for their support and trusting that we were able to make this an awesome opportunity for all of our students. And again, our students just did a great job. They really, really did. Um, and a few staff members too really helped. Jen Billings, who runs our service learning class, worked closely with the day of service. So that was huge help because she connects with the sites and the organization piece. Also Nate Trubiano, who does our SAT and PSAT testing anyway, helped coordinate that. And as well as Lindsay Donaldson, who has stepped up and gone far and above and beyond with the MyFlex Learning for organizing all of these students. So everybody had a place to go. We could account for the students. And that was outstanding. Our, our staff, our clerical staff as well, were hugely helpful. Christine Tchaikowski, who had a big hand in the PSATs and organized with the school counseling department, as well as the admin team. And I can go on and on and on. But I, if I were to give the recommendation, I would strongly encourage doing this again because it benefited students in a large way uh, in many different capacities. And I think with the feedback we received, we can improve the product even further moving forward. So I'll stop now because I'm sure I went over my allotted time. Um, but thank you again for trusting us and providing the opportunity and with the Dr. Bucky and Nan Murphy's support as well to allow us to take a chance with this. And we're very appreciative of that support. Thank you. I was really glad to see that back on uh, for this year and, and thank you for that update. So it's, it sounds like it's just all kinds of really good things. And um, you know, from my perspective, you're absolutely right that kind of that ease back in from that long weekend and the, and the SEL component to that. I think that long weekend was really needed for all of our students and really nice for the high school to be able to kind of step back in instead of you know, right back into classes. So thanks, Dan. Sarah, I saw your hand up. Um, yeah, no, we usually do the calendar in January, so we should be able to tag the information that Dan just gave to us in with that discussion and give him an answer in enough time to kind of like notify families for travel plans and things like that. Um, I just wonder, what one of my questions calendar-wise is that makes that a two-and-a-half-day week versus like if we did it the weekend like the friday before does that then give people uh a, a four and a half day weekend if you know what i mean yeah and you know i i probably should have conversed more in terms of the recommendation but i wanted to be transparent as that was was discussed you know and as with anything else in, terms of, in terms of our i bet it <laughs> in terms of our calendar and how it works you know we call it day zero for a reason it's a day that's accounted for that's working with staff. So it's just up to us to work on the rotation. That's why it's day zero. So the day is built, it, it's built in. So okay. again, there's a lot to, to look at that piece, but um, a very simple um, recommendation. Sorry, my, my computer keeps sliding <laughs> off the toy bucket. It's I, I, I'd like to thank our nurses too, because they did a lot of work making sure that all students that needed attention for the sites, they, they did have what they needed. So, and, and they, they went above and beyond as well. As always. Wonderful experience. Megan, did you have something? I don't want to be repetitive here, but I feel like um, there was a lot of moving parts there, Dan. Um, and I think it's great that you were able to accommodate the different needs for your students at different levels. So um, I 100% support um, moving, you know, doing this again, the day of service, I think is so important for our students. And it's really impressive to hear the feedback from the organizations that they worked with in terms of the engagement and enthusiasm. So hats off to our students and to you, Dan, and your staff for pulling off what sounds like a very, very busy day. Thank you. All right, thank you for joining us, Dan. We really appreciate that update and uh, we'll look forward to hearing it next year as well. Thank you. So maintaining, keeping, uh, planning for success on the front, uh, Burner and on everyone's radar, uh, I'm ask uh, Assistant Superintendent Nan Murphy to give a brief update on the teaching and learning components, the curriculum piece for that, uh, in addition to an update uh, on the K-3 scheduling group that she's been meeting with. So those will be the two presentations that Nan has. Great. Good evening, everyone. Sarah Gold, if you wouldn't mind, can I share my screen? All right. You should be able to now. Awesome. Thank you. We can see it. All right. 
So um, Dr. Um, Bucky asked me to update the team on two initiatives that's currently happening in my office. And the first one is um, having the conversation around the elementary schedule. If we think back um, to early August um, or in September, we had um, a lot of conversation in the community around needing to understand and want to know a little bit more about the, the schedule, in particular the recess block. So we have had two meetings um, and discussed a number of different things. But before I get into that, I just want to share with you some of the guiding principles that the team that developed the schedule anchored the work in. We're not there with all of these, but these were the priorities that the team isolated. The um, first one being common planning time for our teachers to work collaboratively and professionally. We really value our teachers and want them to be able to lean into each other. There's so much work to do, so much curriculum coming at them that we really wanted to prioritize their time with each other. We also wanted to incorporate something for the district called the WIN block, which I spoke briefly about. WIN stands for what I need. And through this working group in our last meeting in particular, um, I got the understanding that really the parent community is looking for more information around what is the WIN block and as well as teachers. And um, Co coincidentally, we had our first professional development, which was grounded in that. So we were able to provide professional development around the wind block and how to use the wind block for our classroom teachers. But just to reiterate for people who are out there listening, the wind block is a block of time in a uh, academic schedule that allows teachers the time to respond to kids at their academic levels in what their needs are. So if you have a student that needs some intervention and some reteaching, you can group them with like students that need the similar skills built um, and work with them. And during that time, students are, you have planned and organized for other students in your classrooms with other skill levels to be working collaboratively or independently reinforcing those skills and practicing those skills. We are getting to the point in Marblehead, which is really exciting by bringing in a new um, assessment tool. We have the iReady assessment, which has replaced the Ames web assessment that the district has had previously. This is a much more comprehensive program. It comes with standards-based assessments, so we know how our students are doing K through 12 based on the ELA standards and based on the math standards. And the program then provides the data to teachers by grouping students with like needs. So you can take the assessment, you can see where students are excelling or delayed, and it will group the students based on need, and then it will generate and offer you instructional lessons. So those are lessons that can be uh, used in centers, they can be used independently for kids, they can be used um, in groups with teacher, direct teacher instruction. So we're hoping to really utilize that tool to grow our wind block and to have it become a much more in um, what, what we talk about in data is in real time. So data is only as good as what you do with it. So this win block allows us to use the data tool, gather our data and do something about it right away with kids. Um, so the other priority was teaching with fidelity. So using all of the different components of our programming and um, with that is um, concentrated blocks. So as opposed to having your ELA, you're reading in the morning, you're writing in the afternoon, you're interactive read aloud later in the afternoon. We really wanted concentrated blocks for, two, for the content areas. We wanted exposure to both the science and social studies standards at every grade level. We really wanted to target our staffing support and where push-in support was happening for teachers. And as always, we wanted to support our students with SEL and cultural responsive teaching and learning. 
So what we did at our first meeting was after we kind of introduced ourselves and familiarized ourselves with um, issues around um, the, the schedule, we went out and sought, every committee member went out and sought feedback from stakeholders. So teachers, families, um, some in some cases students came where we were able to come back and share out what we had learned. So some of the strengths that people were able to um, determine were teachers really valued that common planning time. And um, they, they like being able to, to meet and, and be accessible to each other every day at the same time. They like the consistency of the daily schedule. Students really like ha- being able to come in and know what their academic day looks like every single day. Um, and that is the key to trauma sensitive schools is a consistent schedule. So um, we've been able to provide that for our students and teachers access to um, support staff. So we're having teachers say they've never had so much support in their classrooms. Um, So that's been a real plus. Uh, Aligned approach to services. So the development of our special education teacher schedules and our tutor schedules have been really um, much easier and more comprehensive. We've, um, a principal was able to talk about an opportunity to support teachers in um, being able to go into, into all four classrooms or five classrooms and watch an ELA cl- um, block evolve by going from one room to another, to another, to another, that all the students were having the same conversations, that um, the teachers were having the same materials in use. And so that was really um exciting for the principal to be able to articulate and talk about with a team, having seen the same lesson. The the strengths is teachers saw the potential with the the wind block, but they weren't there yet um, in some cases. And again, that feedback came after the PD, before the PD was provided to them. And then the strength was the two recess blocks and the opportunity for unstructured play. So some of the challenges was, clarity around how to use the wind block, which we're getting there. Uh, The length of the allied arts block was turning out to be a challenge that it was 55 minutes long and um, that, you know, it's hard to to hold attention at that point um, on, in one particular room and content for 55 minutes. Um, limited transition time, and by limited, I mean it's not accounted for in the schedule. So we have classes bumping up against each other. And um, the health block, we had established the health block as a as that fifth content area um, to prioritize SEL. Coming back from a pandemic, we just did not know what to expect. So we felt like it was the responsible thing to do to make sure there was the time and the space for students to build relationships and have some guided, facilitated conversations around social, emotional health and well-being. What we're finding now is, well, I'll get to that in just a minute. So we're finding that the health block, the content that that our teachers were using, the Second Steps program, two things, teachers love it and want it in their classrooms. And our allied arts teachers were saying the health block at the Glover one one day a week, it's not enough time to get to where we wanna go with that curriculum. So that was a challenge. Um, Also a challenge finding time for the science and social studies without having to take it from uh, another content area. And then the challenge, you know, kind of connecting to that is that recess block, the um, just time it's, it's a, it's a six hour day, which is, which is tough. Um, So as a result of our meeting, we um, came to um, a couple of recommendations. And I have not shared this with our classroom teachers yet because the first people that I wanted to share it with were our allied arts team. And I just had a Zoom with them. And I wanted them to have feedback based on our recommendations so that if they felt like it needed to be further tweaked, they had the opportunity to inform those decisions because it primarily affects their work. So the recommended changes is we are going to eliminate the health block 
And what that means is that at the Glover, because um, both principles, both elementary principles were able to articulate that there really does not seem to be this overt need at schools for concentrated SEL um, that we were had anticipated and planned for. So we're going to transition that block back to a rotating allied arts. So on Fridays at the Glover, instead of having art, the students will have an additional allied art that week. And so they'll have two, perhaps on one Friday, if you had music on Wednesday and it's your classroom's time for Friday, you'll have music on Friday. That next week you'll have music on Tuesday. You'll have art on Friday. The next week you'll have music on Tuesday, library on Friday. So if, you, if you're kind of getting the pattern there. At the brown, that looks different. The brown has five, what we call strands. So there are five classrooms per grade level. So at the brown, they are going to actually have, because we have a certified um, physical education teacher, two gym classes a week. Um, and that's the, we're, we're kind of still tweaking that in terms of when that will start because that they have two gym teachers, two PE teachers there. And so those two T PE teachers will work through that together. Um, but we are looking to begin that change as far as health will be taken off the schedule. Um, at the Glover, we're planning to do that next Friday. And at the Brown, because our Brown um, additional fifth class teaches it five days a week, and has a developed content to carry through the first marking period, um, she'd like the opportunity to be able to continue that. And, and we wanna certainly honor her, the work she's done in planning that curriculum. So that um, transition will happen um, December 6th when the new term begins. And then the other um, change that's coming as a recommendation is we are looking for an additional block of time uh, so that the district can provide facilitated professional development to teachers once a week. And per contract, we can do that by adding a sixth allied arts block. And so our students um, in December, most likely we'll start this in December with a new time because this will take a bit for us to figure out where it fits. Um, there'll be one additional block of allied arts um, for students one day a week. So this gets us back to what we heard parents saying and um, that they really valued having those two allied arts opportunities in a week. And so on one day, um, we'll be back to that schedule. So I'm gonna pause there before I go on to planning for success to see if anybody has any questions for me. Um, Emily? Um, does the allied arts block um, time change, like the amount of minutes? Thank you, Emily. Yes, it does. Okay. It does. Yep. So that our allied arts blocks will go back to 45 minutes and that time will be truncated, truncated, truncated <laughs> and brought to um, the allied arts in the morning. We're thinking that additional block will be in the morning. I think Sarah? that's a great idea. Oh, great. <laughs> Sarah? Just on top of that, then, are, are we giving anything up in order to put that additional allied blo arts block in? No, we, we won't be. We'll be shifting those minutes around and um, kind of connecting them with some content that might be already happening. So, no, we're not. So Next Essentially, time. this is going to resemble the sketch with the addition of the wind block. As far as specials go, this will be the special schedule we all knew previously. Um, Correct. Okay. Yep. So I think that simplifies it for parents a little bit that are kind yes. of trying to wrap their head around this, that it just goes back to what it was. Um, and then I would like to, you know, obviously the, we're set for this year budget wise, but where we have this beautiful new building. We have Steven who's put together a team to look at technology um, curriculum that can be aligned. We have a space dedicated to this at the new school. I'm confident we could find one at Glover. 
I really want to make a commitment to adding a STEAM block as a special for every child in our elementary program that they touch that once a week, that that's a special. I know that that was talked about at various times in planning um, over the last few years. I, I, I think that that would benefit our district is in line with our, our initiatives that we wanted to look at with Stephen. And I, and I just want us as we enter budget season to have that in the back of our head that this is something we can and should embrace and is right in line with a commitment we've made. I appreciate you say, saying that, Sarah. Um, Dr. Bucky brought that to me, has already discussed that with me, and, and that's certainly something that we both value and see a need for. Come again. Um, thanks for the update, Nan. I appreciate it. Um, you talked about the concentrated blocks, especially for um, ELA and math. Can you just talk about the benefit to students having that concentrated longer block versus kind of splitting it up like you mentioned? Well, the primary focus of around, um, there's a lot of benefits, Emily, yep. but but the the support staff is a huge benefit. Right. So we have a, we have our ELA tutors and our math tutors. So by having large blocks of concentrated topic areas, they can go in and support students and pull students, from in, you know, from two different classrooms together to work on assignments. But also the the guided reading approach, it's 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 the reader's workshop model, which is primarily what we use here in the district. It's so interconnected with the texts. Um, the, there's a component called the interactive read aloud, where the teacher models a lesson, uh, reads a book out loud with um, prompts and questioning, kids stop and jot. And then that leads then to a writing activity, which then leads to a turn and talks with two, with two authors talking together, which then leads to um, book clubs where they go and develop opportunities to read like texts together. So it's an opportunity for the work to evolve and connect and make more sense of how it all works together. So you're, 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 you're reading a text for the purpose of teaching characteristics because that's what you're going to do in writing. And then yet you're going to connect the phonics to it because there's the blend that you're working on in the read aloud. So it's, um, it's, it's just a, a, a really has a lot of um, interconnectedness to it and just it, it just, if, if you disconnect from it, it's hard to get kids re-engaged. In particular, if students are leaving the room for services and you need to share that read aloud text so everybody can then follow in the stop and jot and the reading act and the writing activity, if you do it at another time and somebody's services at that time and that group isn't in the room, then they miss that text and then they miss the, the writing lesson doesn't make sense. So it's um, it, there's a lot that goes into developing schedules at the elementary level, at every level, but um, in particular at the elementary level. So. Okay. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. I really appreciate that explanation. Um, the other question I had was taking that or by removing the health block, um, how does that impact the delivery of the second step and the SEL, the implementation of that curriculum? So can you just talk about how second step is implemented throughout the elementary levels? So in the, in the past, um, second step happens in the classrooms at different, from my understanding, at different times based on teachers. There are lessons like units on um, developing class community. How, what does a good student look like? Well, a good student listens, a good student waits their turn, a good, you know, depending on the developmental age of kids. And so those lessons are kind of embedded all day long for some, for some teachers. Some teachers might use um, morning meeting to reinforce those skills. So you teach it explicitly and then you have conversations and, and practice for the rest of the week. So um, I think teachers would go right back to how they have done it customarily, which is kind of on their own. They, have, they all have shared kits in the district. They all have the same materials and have been doing it for a long time and had 
had great success and really missed it when we brought it to the health and um, content area. Okay, great. And then just following on from that, how does that work with and or does it with the PBIS that we have in the district? So great question. Um, I, I would leave that to our elementary principals to articulate. I have not um, really seen a lot in, in terms of what's happening in schools with PBIS. I mean, last year, we just, it wasn't a normal year. So all of the typical components of PBIS, I haven't been able to see, which are class, um, school assemblies, which are um, tokens that you earn and opportunities for rewards, both intrinsic and extrinsic. I haven't seen those. So um, maybe that might be something that the elementary principals would enjoy being able to, to share with you. Yeah, that would be great, John, if we could talk through that um, and get some more information on how that's working now that we're back in the classrooms. Sure. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to put that on a future agenda. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, thank you, Nan. I appreciate it. Sure. Tara, it sounds seems like you wanted to ask another question. Yeah, I, another question, but my, a clarification too. Um, my understanding with second steps is it's not per se a standalone curriculum that would have really felt fit this health block per se, but it's really a curriculum that to, to be successful is embedded mm -hmm. in the everyday classroom pulling those pieces in, you know, a lot of times homework will come home about it for a family discussion. Mm -hmm. It's really like a living lesson that's integrated daily um, to make it successful. And I think that's the way the curriculum is designed that we purchased. Um, and then the, at least that's my understanding um, how it was presented in the past. And then my question is, how are we utilizing or how do we plan to utilize not just the student specific assessments, but things like our MCAS assessments, where to give the example, we know that last year's third grade math was only partially meeting expectations. When we have that block of knowledge, are we transferring that into then making more math teachers available during the wind block for which is now the fourth grade class? Um, are we using these, these tools that we have at our disposal to maximize um, outcomes and know where we should target and bolster? Great question. So first, I just want to hit on the second steps piece. The, the second steps kits that we were utilizing were just to get us th through the first month while we worked with allied arts staff to develop what, what were we going to do during that block. Um, so that was never intended for um, the entire year or to become the content of that area. We did have a plan to go much deeper with content. Um, but as far as the data and the MCAS data, so I, I do, again, last year was such a different year. Um, this year we have um, in November, I'm bringing a data specialist in who works for our, our assessment tool. And they're going to give leaders, they're coming to leadership, and we're going to go through a, a data analysis activity at the leadership level. And then leaders will be able to then go into schools using both the current MCAS data available to them and the iReady data available to them. So our fourth grade teachers will have current data from third for, on their current students, how they did on third grade MCAS standards and how they're doing based on iReady data on the fourth grade standards. So we are going to be well positioned for those conversations, Sarah. Um, yeah, a couple questions from me. So has any discussion gone into the length of the school day? Because I know that was something that it, you know, and you mentioned like it's, it is tight, it's six hours. And that was something that when we, first had this conversation had been tossed out as something to look at? Mm -hmm. So yes, um, and I wanna share with you the next slide. So this is something I went over with the team last week. Um, based on the Massachusetts frameworks and what we know in education around what it takes to teach to the Massachusetts standards, these are the allocated times by subject area. Morning meeting is actually supposed to be 20 to 25 minutes, but as a teacher myself, when I did it, 15 minutes was enough to do it. 
Um, but really ELA should be 90 minutes, math 90 minute block, science and social studies should be a 45 minute block, win block should be at minimum a 30 minute, preferably 45 minutes, and your allied arts should be 45 minutes. This is just um, general timing. It, it's if you look at your framework, if you look at the curriculum map, if you look at the minutes allocated in the programs when you adopt them, this is what they tell you. We adopted a math program last year. Their, their scripted lessons for our teachers are 90 minutes. We don't have a 90 minute block right now, but that's what that's what the program has um, in the material embedded for the for the instruction is not is supposed to take 90 minutes. So if you look at what we have here, we've got 5.25 hours to get through your 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 standards, your your framework. Um, Marblehead has a six hour day. So when you add in lunch and recess and um, transitions, which are not embedded right now in our current schedule. Um, you know, we, 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 it's a it's a tight day. So we have, I mean, there has been conversation about recommending um, a longer school day. That's not across every member of our group. Not everybody is going to be, you know, in consensus about that, I would imagine. Um, so whether that comes out as a, a recommendation, I'm not sure. Um, but it's definitely going to be our next conversation is how do we fit it all, right? Yeah, definitely. Good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that that still is, is a part of the conversation because um, it just seems like it, it like, you know, just as you're laying it out right now, it still has to be. Um, do we, we have a 6.25 hour school day though, don't we? Well, it, you know, I guess it would depend on if you include, um, if it goes from the one, uh, the 8.15 or 8 o'clock. I mean, there's, the, the students are marked absent at, at, at 8.15. So that's typically when those hours start. And our so, day goes 30, I think, right? So... I've got a few yeah. concerns over the the health block being eliminated. Um, my 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 first concern is that we don't have a health block anymore, and so we're not. You know, I know that we don't have a curriculum at this point, but that that was something that was talked about um, for the future, and that you know I would love to see it not just be health being about, you know, in high school because it's a state mandate, but then also, you know, at the lower grades when it's just puberty as they hit the village school. Um, Cause I think there's a lot to be done in it within that curriculum. Um, I also, so when, when, I know one is starting on 10 to 27 and then one in, in December for the Brown, will both schools then sort of, if you were to, if you were to go to Brown, versus if you were to go to Glover, are those kids getting the same education? Experience maybe is a better word. Yes, they are getting the same experience, but Sarah, we had very transparent conversation about the fact that the Brown is going to have two PE classes because there are two PE teachers. Um, whereas at the Glover, they will rotate through and their extra class a week will be rotating. The reality is we have two different, the chemistry in two different schools, there's five classrooms in one and four in the other. So we, we don't have that additional content teacher that's there all the time. So unless we asked all of our teachers, instead of teaching health to do an additional PE, even if you're an art teacher or a music teacher or a librarian, um, it can't be equitable it's going to be equal in terms of fun and exposure to amazing instruction. It's just not going to be the same content area. And parents at the table did not have a problem with that. We had Glover parents and we had Brown parents and we had Glover teachers and we had Brown teachers and no one saw a problem with that, that the reality is we just have two different schools and we can't make it picture perfect based on what we have in front of us. I guess my only concern with that is that, you know, what happens when our demographic, sh get the dem demographic shifts a little bit again, because I, I think, you know, up to this year, we've had 
more kids at the at the Glover and higher ratios there than we have at the other schools. Um, and so, you know, what? Well, how does it? How do we retailer that um, once that once that switches again? Mm -hmm. sharing the story of a couple in Sorry, I just needed to mute someone. So um, I, I, yeah, I, I think what we have is a, at least an approach. Um, and I think we would have to tweak it based on the content um, year to year. But because um, I, I, I don't know if we can and what we can anticipate for classes and, and across the um, different grade levels. And we may have one grade level that has five and another grade level that has four. So um, I'm not exactly sure how that'll work, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll do our best. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I guess my, my final concern is that, you know, and I, and I, and I can understand that the lack of a need for like a, an intense SEL, you know, health block type class, um, mm -hmm. that that's thankfully not sort of where we're at and what we're seeing. Um, and I'm not, I'm not super surprised at that. I do get concerned though, that, you know, just to make sure that it's, it isn't kind of, well, we're not seeing this. So, you know, we're sort of back to our normal situation. Cause I don't think we're back to our normal situation either. I think at the, I think at all levels, quite frankly, that the socialization for our kids is off, um, that it's, that it's stunted at this point. And mm -hmm. so I think, you know, at each level, you see that coming out differently um, in the way that, that developmentally our, our children um, socialize. So, I just want to make sure that, you know, whereas we've taken it directly out, that it's still really being sprinkled um, throughout. Um, and I'm, I'm sure it is. I just I it's, couldn't not yeah. say it. It's not <laughs> only being sprinkled, sprinkled, but it, it is going to be concentrated in some places or in the wind block because some kids, what they need is a, is more social experiences or more explicit teaching around appropriate behaviors or way to transition in the hallways or executive functioning skills and how to how to manage yourself when you're you know in a sit in a loud cafeteria and what your options are so it's not all academics that's happening during that wind block we have the whole school on deck to support that instruction so we still have our allied arts teachers all present during the wind block for that kind of explicit teaching we have our school guidance counselors available during that wind block for social groups. Um, so that that will absolutely be embedded in that block because we, we, we will have students that need that at different times throughout the year. Great, thanks, Nan. So yep. can I just follow on from that? Nan, thank you for explaining that because that's been on my mind to the social, mm -hmm. the social learning piece that has been missed over the past 18 months or two years and that you know we focus a lot on the academics which are obviously very important but the social piece and then you know being able to then access the academics so i'm glad that you specified on that wind block and to hear that that's happening there too mm -hmm. yeah. and a lot of the executive functioning um has been work has been explicitly taught during the the wind block before we get these groups and all of our data sorted. So what does it what does it look like in our classroom when the teacher is working with a small group and you have a question? How do you where can you go for help? How do you figure that out? I mean, those are all things that need to be explicitly taught for kids to work independently. And so that's what teachers have been using the wind block instruction for. So when the small groups really do start coming together, kids can really do well. Um, and uh, together and independently during that time. Great, thanks. Um, one contract question with this. Um, Nan, is there, does this create more equity within the contract of all of our teachers really hitting their, the same hours across yes. various things? Okay, and we're not, we're not outside of scope for contract on anything, correct? No, oh no, no. Okay. Yep. And then just real quickly, I want to take you through um, just, I, I meant to text Dr. Bucky today. We had such a positive experience today. We had our first meeting for planning for success um, in building out um, our strategic objective for, for teaching and learning. 
it was so productive and so positive. People were excited about the work. It's a lot of work, but um, that we're excited about it and really isolating it. So um, I am John, um, Dr. Bucky has uh, uh, tasked me with running a working group that's gonna be able to uh, develop a plan that can be measured with benchmarks throughout this year to build out one of our strategic initiatives around the objective of fully aligning teaching and learning pre-K to 12 with our multi-tiered systems of support framework to ensure, sorry about that, um, to ensure all students meet or exceed academic and social emotional learning expectations. So in September was the part of establishing the working group. In our working group, we have um, building leaders, teachers, representatives from special education and student support. And uh, today we met and went through our first uh, initiative and we came up with building out two components that will get us to where we need to be with a fully aligned teaching and learning pre-K to 12 plan. And that is um, the first one is to compile, update and further develop a unit um, formally a, a unit uh, uniformly, sorry, I, I speech to text, uh, text to, to type this, um, designed pre-K to 12 curriculum map. And I say compile and update and further develop because there's a level of frustration that I'm learning about in the district over the course of many years, starting as long ago as 10 years ago, where that work has been kind of trickling in and then not further developed to a place of publication and a place that really drives the work. And so I wanna honor the people that have been working for years on trying to develop a curriculum map because there are components of those out in the district. We just need to find them all and go through them and update them and share them broadly across the district so everybody's on the same page. That is going to be a, a big task. Um, the second thing we all came to consensus of, around is to examine the current scope and sequence, which was developed in the spring, in order to come to consensus on content across grade levels, departments, schools, and the district. So um, kind of unpacking the um, Rebecca Brand and I were and working with other um, people in the district were able to put together a scope and sequence around what should be happening and where based on the standards. And now we need to go the next level and say, is this really happening? And if it is happening, what materials are we using? And really kind of going deeper into that examination. So that's that's kind of where we landed today. And I feel really positive that this is gonna really unite the district around teaching and learning and be a, a, a really great place to feed future work in the next four years after this year. Everything we do will feed into this aligned approach. Megan? Um, not to put you on the spot. <laughs> I'm just curious if there is timeline attached to you know when you expect to have these pieces completed or another update to the school committee so this the 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 way i understand developing a strategic plan is you first uh develop the objective which we have then you identify the strategic initiative, which we have, and then the two benchmark, which is these two elements here, these are the, the way we're gonna measure how we get there. Mm -hmm. So this these two initiatives will most likely take us this school year to unpack. We're gonna bring our lead teachers on board to work with us um, through this process. And then in the spring, we reevaluate and look at the work. Hopefully it will all be done. If it's not, we prioritize the areas that we need to, to work deeper on. We'll use some of our summer planning time to, to do the, this work. And then we'll start looking at other initiatives into that's, that are already on the plan and thinking what, what which ones are next. And so we'll pull out more initiatives for next year. So every year it's gonna be new initiatives 
but they're all connecting with each other. So, just, so it'll take us five years. This work will take us until June. Okay, and I think maybe maybe we need to dive into this in a little more detail, you know, offline. But just thinking about, you know, obviously we've got an accelerated budget schedule too. So how do we tie in the work that you're doing and forward thinking enough so that we are adequately planning and accounting for what we're going to need in our budget, especially because we're going to accelerate that timeline. Mm -hmm. So that's a piece I, I think, you know, maybe you two can talk about offline and we can, we can follow up with you. We also, uh, as a working group today, put it on the agenda for our November and early December all admin meeting agendas so that we're talking about this as a district, uh, a, a, as a district of leaders, what needs to happen to make this work um, feasible. So that, that'll yeah. help. Those conversations will help. Sarah? Um, so to expand on what Megan's saying a little bit is, and again, this is putting pressure on you. I, you know, it just is what it is. But I, I think that, you know, if you're having these conversations in November and December, the hope I think was that we know what initiatives are going to require additional staffing, therefore budget, kind of before December, because we we need to start, you know, building our budget and advocating for it and knowing what that money's going towards. So, you know, we want to make sure that you're able to do your work in a meaningful way. But at the same time, we have to make sure that we can advocate for what you guys need to be as successful as you can be in these initiatives. Mm -hmm. And then my, then my second piece to that is I just want to make sure we're actually not getting an initiative fatigue for, you know, our staff or students, you know, I, I know where we introduced a new schedule and the wind block, and then we have this, and then we have the technology initiative. It, you know, to, to make a, a success out of all of these, I wonder if we need to have a conversation with it that brings that timeline of all these cross sections together and that we're not throwing, you know, six, seven, eight initiatives at the same staff for a current year. Cause I want to make sure that these are all very successful and our staff is amazing, but you know, everybody has their limitations. Mm -hmm. Duly noted. I completely agree. I think what we're going to find is that this work, because it is so focused on improving what the current conditions are, I think our teachers are going to be happy to see this work and be engaged in these initiatives. I, I have to be honest, I've never been in a district that did not have a curriculum map or a scope and sequence. So how teachers are managing the expectations of the standards-based instruction is really it's got to be hard to do. So I think this work will really help them um, plan together, be able to, um, you know, collaborate and, and, and assess students. We don't, until this fall, we've never had an assessment calendar in a district to my understanding. So like all of these things will connect and I think teachers will be, um, I think there are some initiatives, Sarah's, that that are really cumbersome. I think I think people will be able to get behind this. I think we'll have to overcome the fact that they've been asked to be part of these things and it hasn't come to fruition over the last ten years. Um, we have to get them to believe that this one really will happen and that this is part of a five-year plan, um, and we're committed to the work. But I think getting them once we can get them in, in invested in that mission, I think they're going to probably be excited to be part of the process. I'm hoping. And I think a big part of that is where these initiatives, I think the stopgap has been in all of these is the, we develop the initiative and then we need the funding to back it. And I think that's what Megan wants to make sure we have those numbers in time so that we're giving you the funding so that you can, you know, get across the finish line with this initiative, all these initiatives and not hit that stopgap that we keep hitting for the last 10 years. Got it. Thank you, Nan. Going to the bond to Dr. Donnelly in the pre-K? I think so. Thank you very much, Nan. This is all very informative. Um, I really appreciate you coming and, and giving such a thorough presentation and, uh, and withstanding our questions too. <laughs> Absolutely. 
So you had in the Dropbox the memo from Dr. Donnelly about the need to uh, add a pre-K uh, section with a teacher and a paraprofessional. Um, Dr. Donnelly will be here, uh, is here, if you have uh, questions for her on that memo. Um, Dr. Donnelly. Um, good evening. Yes, so I sent the memo through Dr. Bucky um, last week. I just wanted to provide um, tonight, you know, certainly an opportunity for you to ask any questions that you might have, but also just provide a little bit more information regarding the need. Um, so we are projecting that we will need, at this point, one sub-separate classroom. So a, that would be staffed by a teacher um, and two support staff. We right now anticipate, even though we can't formally make the recommendations for placements until a full IEP team meeting is held, um, we do anticipate knowing what we know now, at least two to three students starting in that classroom imminently. Um, but I did also just want to note that we currently have 26 um, pre-K age referrals um, that we know of right now. Right now, only three of them are early intervention students who are more than six months away from turning three years old and thus being potentially eligible for school-based services. So 14 of those 26 are from early intervention, but as I said, three of them are around six months out from potential enrollment and 12 of them are parent referrals. So that is a, um, a significant number of students. Um, you know, there are some we anticipate some high needs students in that group. Um, and, you know, as we learn more information, we'll have a better sense of what we may need further down the road, but this, this level of staffing does feel necessary at this point in time. Thanks, Paula. Um, Megan, I see your hand up, and then Sarah, I think I just saw yours too. Um, th thanks for this update, Paula, I appreciate it. Um, do you, and this might, question might actually be more directed at Michelle if Michelle Crest is on, but unless I missed it in the memo, but is there a cost associated with this? Do you know how much is this gonna cost us? So I will admit to being um, too green to have really I just saw Michelle's face pop that. up. <laughs> uh, but I'm on board be, to answer it, be, it as well, so. Yeah, a teacher and two, um, two support staff at this point, you know, if we were to make you know, to make sure that it was the same as what's at Glover, it would be a teacher and two tutors, not paraprofessionals. Um, the estimated cost for that would be about 110,000. So, and we will, we are able to cover those costs through our revolving fund. Our preschool enrollment um, was, we're, is a little higher than we anticipated it to be. So we didn't fully where we were expanding the program last year, we didn't want to count all of the revenues. So we do have a little bit of flexibility there, but it essentially will use up the rest of the um, unaccounted for revenues coming into the revolving fund. Okay, thanks, Michelle. And then Paula, is if we're creating a new classroom, what's the, is there a maximum number of students? Um, I'm assuming these are all students on IEPs in this classroom. So is there a maximum number? Yes, so because this, we would be considering this a sub-separate classroom, the max number of students in that class with a teacher and one, um, the Reg Say aide, is nine students. And we're, and right now it's at three? Right now we're projecting um, three, four, it could go, we expect it will go higher, we just don't know for sure yet. Um, right now in terms of openings in the integrated classrooms, there are at, if both Glover and Brown each have room for seven additional students uh, with disabilities and two model students at Glover and I believe one at Brown. So can you just clarify for me? I forget that I forget how the ratios work, but if we were to add all seven of those additional students with IEPs, do we have to have those two, you know, those model students as well? Yeah, so those numbers indicate how they would be spread out across all of the classrooms. Yeah. So um, the regulations indicate that we can have up to 15 students in a classroom with a teacher and an aide if, six, if only six or seven of them are identified as students with a disability. So the ratio can't be 50-50. There's got to be one more student without a disability than, than with to be considered an integrated classroom. 
Okay. So mathematically, it sounds like we have this sub separate classroom and that is different than the integrated program yes. that we have, yes. that we have an immediate need that we need to approve that for. And that, that's a no brainer. We need it. We need yes. to do it, period, in my, in my mindset. But then with what's coming down the pipeline, whether it's parent referrals or EI, it sounds like there's a very real likelihood that we are going to need to add on top of that, another integrated classroom at the preschool level be, before the end of the school year in order to A, make our ratios and to accommodate students properly. Yes. I, th- so I we think one that... ask now and one ask within I... the next couple months. Yeah, there, it, it may be. I think it's, you know, it's hard for us to tell with so many referrals. We haven't had chance to get eyes on all of these kiddos mm-hmm. yet to even make an educated projection, which is even still kind of dancing around what we should, <laughs> what we should be doing in terms of predetermining eligibility or placement. Um, but I do think there is the poten- there is potential for that need, um, knowing that these 26 right now will not be the last of the referrals that we get. Yep. And so that budget is one piece. Space, mm-hmm. we're good on one classroom. We're probably starting to hit a wall when we need our second mm-hmm. classroom. So we, we need to be thinking down the pipeline for space too. Yes. Um, and I, I just, you know, I want us all to be cognizant of all this. Mm-hmm. And then, which raises the question, one, we can absor- absorb through the revolving fund. And Michelle, if you want me to hold this until the finance portion, I'm, I'm happy to, but it's coming up now. So that's why I'm, I'm going there is, hi, you're back, um, is, you know, we haven't ha- had a budget freeze in two years, but in the past, it was like October, November, here we go. Are we in likelihood, and if we're being honest, are we looking at a budget freeze? And if so, when's your best estimate? It typically, um, I was going to say, I was every year as a business manager, except for the past two years, I think I have had a budget freeze. Um, and I'm not speaking on, 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 on Marblehead's behalf. I'm talking in my other districts as well. Um, so that's not an unforeseen thing by any means. Typically, it does happen in late December. Um, so if it's coming, I would expect it in late December. We have had some unexpected expenses that we've dealt with so far this year. Um, nothing that we can't handle at this point, but if we should have any additional surprises, I do expect we would freeze the budget, but at this point, I can't say confidently that we would. Um, I think we're holding our own for the time being, but, um, one little thing can push us, you know. Would this additional classroom hit us at a budget freeze? No, not necessarily. No, not no. the one tonight, but like if we need this extra one. Oh, if we need an additional one, it, it it would put us in that category where I think we need to start watching things closely. And it would be actually a soft budget freeze. It wouldn't be a hard, absolutely can't spend anything. It would be more discretionary items um, and things that we don't absolutely need. But I mean, if there's things we need, we don't hesitate in making and finding a way to get them. So it would be what we call a soft budget freeze. Michelle, can you expand on that piece, especially with this need, because we've got, I mean, from what we've heard, I think it was last week or the week before, we've got 250000 in the circuit breaker fund that we've, you know, created that buffer. And we also have 250000 in the special ed reserve. So that's $500,000. So you're saying this cost is going to exceed that and require us no, you, you want to keep a certain amount of um, special ed tuitions in reserve because Absolutely. at any point in the year they can come along and they can be pretty substantial. I mean, they start roughly at 50000 yeah. and and we could have one student cost us, you know, $150,000, dollars right. yeah. So we definitely want to try to keep that in reserve. So when we start to see things going out of whack a little bit, not necessarily saying we're going to use every single penny in every single reserve account. Um, just if we start seeing things, you know, trending a little bit more than we like, or um, we just need to watch it a little more closely. It basically just puts the onus on me where the principals need to ask me basically for everything they spend. Um, and, you know, if, it, if it's an essential item, absolutely we spend it. If it's an essential repair, if it's an essential student need, we, we deal with it. But if it's something that we absolutely don't need, then, then we'll put it off. Or if it's a, if it's an improvement, if it's a new equipment purchase, we'll just put it off until later in the year when we have a better handle on the budget. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you need a motion from us, Michelle, to pl- uh, approve this, these additional funds or hires? Um, 
I'm not sure exactly, to be honest. Um, I don't think we do because this is basically operational and we can't not do it. True. Yeah. Um, Want me to... Uh, no, just I had I, I think Paula. Um, I just wanted to say, for me, this this is indicative of the pandemic. Um, this is the type of thing you know. This is like the socialization skills I was talking about with the kids that are K to three. That these are, are you know you mentioned some of these kids are coming from early intervention, which is you know historically where how we know what's going on and how we can predict things really well. Um, and but you mentioned that there's a lot of parent referrals this is this piece where people have been in their homes and not receiving services, um, not going into preschools earlier than, you know, earlier than what our preschools might pick up. Um, and, and so these are the types of things that, that I think, you know, for the foreseeable future, we can in, anticipate the unanticipated um, and, and that we'll continue to see this. So, you know, I think um, it just deserves to be said that, that, um, you know, these are these pieces that I think will will continue to come up as we kind of move out of, of the pandemic and the fallout kind of continues. Now, can you get the staff? <laughs> um, that, is the, that is the million dollar question this year. Um, I think that talking with um, with Meredith Wishart and other people in the building, we do feel that there may be um, one, one, two, maybe really strong internal candidates um, that may not have to, we may not need to use an emergency waiver um, from DESE for licensure or anything like that. So we may be able to find somebody in-house um, and then it may be you know, having to broaden the search for the support staff. Okay, thanks Paula. Moving along. Moving along. All right. I am uh, asking the school committee to vote to approve an increase in our daily sub rate. Uh, there was a, a survey that went out uh, around the North Shore superintendents, and we were among the lowest on the North Shore at $80 a day. Um, I'm asking that we move that up to 110, um, which would make us probably the most competitive uh, in the area. Again, uh, we can't get day subs and I'm thinking 110 if you have the option of going next door to Swampscott that's 100 or to another neighboring district that might be 80 or 95 uh, it might make us more attractive and so I would appreciate your support in increasing the daily sub rate. Great. Thank you. We need a motion for that. Um, yeah I'll just take a motion then we can then we can comment. Um, can I get a motion to approve the increase to the substitute teacher pay to $110 per day? So moved. So moved. I'll second. Okay, Sarah and then Megan's second. Sarah, go ahead. So I think this is going to help hopefully quite a bit to towards being the employer of choice. One thing I, I think we need to talk about on one of our future agendas is also bringing up our, our para rate. Um, that is insanely low. At, at times, I think it's below actually minimum wage. So here's the issue is we have people that as a para would be qualified as a sub. And if they gave up their job as a para, they'll make more money subbing here. Yep. So for a para who doesn't need benefits, we just suddenly made it better for them almost financially to do, to do this. So my point is, I think we need to look at what are we not able to hire the paras, the tutors, the subs, and why? And, and my inclination is probably is we're not paying competitively for those areas, particularly the paras and the subs. And we're fixing the subs right now. But I'd like us to fix the paras because we're woefully understaffed with paras. And, um, you know, Michelle can tell you that she's been a kindergarten para. Mm -hmm. And I, I think what we'd save in keeping her out of that, that kindergarten para position would probably pay, fund itself right there. Um, but but I, I think we need to put this on a future agenda and really look at what we can afford and what is going to allow us to properly staff our buildings. I agree, Sarah. And that's a conversation that Michelle and I are having and uh, we are in our paraprofessional pay uh, woefully under. And so stay tuned to a future agenda item. 
Megan? Megan? One other thing I'd like us to consider, and, you know, I know we've got a stuff, you know, a labor shortage, um, you know, everywhere, but we have the um, permanent sub model at vets. And my understanding is that that works well. Um, so if there's, if that's an option also, and just another avenue to relieve a need, I, th I would like us to consider that. I don't know what the cost is associated with that. So we'd need more information there, but I think also we've got a model that works in one school and I would like to see us kind of move to a more consistent model that is more effective. Absolutely. That's another conversation that Michelle and I had this week. Okay. I would fully support that. I think, you know, where we have it, I think we have two at the, at vets. If we were to have, you know, they can, the, the building level principals, I'm sure have the number in their head that would work. They, they know what they're calling in every day, but I, I think at all the schools we could make use of that and then really be guaranteed to a certain extent. I know at times we have no sub in a classroom and one teacher literally with a foot in each classroom. Um, that's not, that's not serving our students or our staff, quite frankly. All right. Um, I'm also all for this. I think I'm glad that we were able to do this, um, before we hit our next budget cycle. Um, so this is, I think, you know, this has been talked about for, for years at this point, and I'm glad that we're moving forward. Okay. I will take a roll call vote. Uh, Emily Barron. Yes. Sarah Gold. Yes. Sarah Fox. Yes. David Harris. Yes. yes. Megan Taylor. Yes. All right. That passes five to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John, did you have any other district updates tonight? <laughs> it's been a long week. <laughs> I one question. Um, now that the MCAS scores have been reported, I know we can all log on and look, you know, through the state, but where you have the reports at your disposal, can you share with the school committee in an email or whatever at some point in the next week, the district and school level reports for all grade levels? Yes, absolutely. That information is readily available in multiple formats. So if there's a particular right. format that you want it in, I'm happy to get it for you. I it, I can read it in whatever format, but I, I think it's just really helpful, especially as we look at, you know, funding initiatives and where we might need more staff. It's a lot easier for us to kind of see some trends. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, that will move us on to our schedule of bills. Uh, can I get a motion to approve the identified schedule of bills totaling $593,856.17? So moved. Megan moved. Can I get a second? Uh, second. <laughs> Emily, second. Any questions on those tonight? All right, I will roll call vote. Uh, Emily Barron? Yes. Sarah Gold, yes. Sarah Fox? Yes. David Harris? Yes. Megan Taylor? Yes. All right, that passes five to zero. Thanks, everyone. Um, okay, that moves us along to school community school committee communication items. Uh, first up will be our diversity, equity, and inclusion mission statement presentation from the Office of Teaching and Learning. Emily and Nan. Yep. So I'm going to um, just update for this evening. So our new um, diversity, equity, and inclusion mission statement was in the Dropbox that everyone got a chance to see. Um, so the mission statement was created for the entire district and it was researched and written um, within our, um, I, we call each ourselves the equity network. Um, we researched and wrote it and we had the help of a consultant. And um, yesterday the statement was shared with all district faculty at each school's faculty meeting. So it's been rolled out. And at our next meeting on thir next Thursday, um, the committee will come and share the presentation with us that they gave to all the faculty because um, it's, it's pretty comprehensive. And tonight I'm gonna read the statement and then we'll have next week to discuss it and ask questions. So we'll give everyone a week to review it since this is you know, its debut. Oh. Okay. Hold on one second. Is it up? 
Yeah. So the DEI statement, Marblehead Public Schools is committed to sustaining an inclusive environment that fosters belonging and acceptance. We apply an equitable cultural relevant lens to student social, emotional, physical, and academic development. Marblehead Public School sees the power of diversity. We support proactive allies. We respect and affirm the unique identities of all people across disability, ethnicity, gender, identity, expression, language, nationality, sexuality, socioeconomic status, race, and religion. Through holistic practices, we cultivate awareness and agency to grow conscious-minded, empathetic citizens. Marblehead Public Schools is committed to an introspective process. We provide ongoing opportunities for learning, reflection, and sharing with all stakeholders. Um, so um, there um, it is. <laughs> thank, thank you for your work on this. Did you find that other districts have students and staff in their statement or is it just pertaining to students? Um, hold on. Oh, students, what, emotional. Well, it says culturally low, relevant yeah. lens, students. I'm wondering if, is it is it customary to focus it only on students or is it, would there be an opportunity to say students and staff? I think. So I, I can. Yeah, Nan, do I, you, I don't. Sure. So I can just um, share that this this DEI statement will sit in the pillar for for diversity, equity, and inclusion that we build out as a um, district team. So not just the network that we have here, but as that work deepens in developing the five year plan through the strategic planning process, there will be another statement that this kind of falls within. And I think that one will include students and staff as well. Okay. okay. I just want to make sure that we, we're following to the path of students see themselves reflected also in our staff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I might be jumping. I might be jumping the gun a bit. First of all, uh, thank you, Nan and Emily, for your work on this. And I think you know from a kind of drawing a line in the sand and making sure that we're all in the same terminology mm -hmm. and, you know, moving in the same direction. This is, um, you know, this is great to see. I'm just wondering, so did I understand correctly next Thursday in our next Thursday meeting? Oh yep. yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. So we'll see that. And then we, we don't need to vote on this or anything, right? It's just more for yeah. information and feedback. Yep. Okay. And then what happens after that? And this is where I might be jumping the gun. What's kind of, where do you take this from there? Nan, can you answer that question? Sure. So once teachers understand it and we start building the under shared understanding as a faculty, we'll start talking about how do we bring this to kids and it, at what developmental level, what language, what terms do we end up using at what grade levels? And teachers will start bringing this um, message around inclusion and equity to our kids and in the selection of some of the texts they use and um, just in the, in the language that we know our teachers are so well adept at scaffolding for kids. But that's the next step is kind of informing all committee um, community members around the language and then sharing it with our parent partners and our com community partners as well. This is this is great. Um, you know, I think this obviously this has been a process. I think your committee has been working for over a year at this point. Um, and I think this is something, you know, that that we've been hearing for quite some time. This came up. The, this, the, the DEI piece um, came up as we interviewed for superintendent candidates. Um, you know, it was something that Dr. Bucky, we all felt that he was very strong in. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's reflected in his goals. It's reflected in the planning for success piece. So I'm thrilled to see this brought forward this evening. Um, you know, thank you everybody on this committee for your, all the hard work leading up to this and, uh, you know, everything that'll be to come. And, you know, I think, to, you know, kind of like Megan's question, like this in my head seems not too dissimilar from like the concept of how we put health into our classrooms um, and and how it's always age appropriate. And it's, you know, it, it, it builds as kids build through our public school system. Um, so I'm, I'm excited for this. I'm excited that this is going to be moved forward um, into into our district and that, you know, we're sort of 
seeing this take shape. Can I can I just add that um, this this is a really comprehensive work that we've that we've been engaged in. But I want to recognize Lindsay Page, Emily Dean, and Maggie Dobin for their independent work over the course of their careers in Marblehead. They have really been trying to work um, this concept out into the community. And it's just been very hard to work in silos. And I think now we have a district unified front around what our values are. Um, but it's, it's, it's really, an, um, it's, it stems from some of the work they've done in the past and their urgency in meeting with me around this and wanting to get this work really unified and aligned. Um, that this came to be. So I just want to recognize the efforts of those three educators because it's been pretty fantastic. Just to kind of elaborate on that, um, we are so lucky to have them mm -hmm. in our district because they have been um, trying to fight for this for a while. And just to see the enthusiasm and dedication that they've had for mm -hmm. this work, um, it's wonderful. So, yeah. Yeah, that's really great. Any other questions? I look forward to the presentation next week. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. All right. Thank you, everyone. All right. Um, so I'm just watching our time. Um, because we we inserted a uh, executive session, I would like to, and, and, you know, in particular that we can punt these things to just a week away, I would like to table the policies. Um, I had them in the, the Dropbox super late today anyways. And then um, I would like to table the school committee goals and evaluation discussion until next week. I think none of them is super pressing um, and just in the interest of time that uh, so that we're not going too late with our meeting, uh, I would move. like to table them. Don't move. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so does anybody have any new business? Through the chair, I just yeah. forgot during commendations to thank the cross country team for suffering the superintendent today and allowing me to attend their practice and try to, it, I use that word very liberally, practice and run uh, with them. Uh, it was it was something that I said, set out last year to do. And finally, a year and a half later, made good on that. And so they were great sports and uh, a really accomplished team. So I appreciated that opportunity today. Were you able to keep up with them? Not a <laughs> chance. <laughs> <laughs> Which is quite impressive because from what I hear, you're a, you're quite a good runner. So <laughs> we do have good teams. All right. Um, there was no correspondence that. I, oh yeah, go oh, ahead. Can I just uh, on on new business? Um, mm -hmm. Just wanted to just a, a follow on to the Brown School. So. Um, the next phase now that the schools open just briefly the um, owner architect contractor team is working on a um, couple of items one is work to be completed so as an example there's a shed to be completed in the back and there's a fence along uh, tower school which we're meeting with with the zoning board on Wednesday whether it's going to be six feet or eight feet that was an ask of uh, tower school so if they decide six feet we'll build it at six feet if the zoning Board approves eight feet, we'll put in an eight foot fence. So we're working through um, the items that are uh, work to be completed. And then there is your, your typical uh, punch list. That punch list is uh, right now getting down below a hundred items. And so work will be happening after hours or on uh, weekends for the punch list. Um, and then there was a review. I just wanted to make it known on, Geez, I, I jumped off the meeting by 1030, but the intent of the meeting on Wednesday was to have a review of what could be considered small wares or asks by um, Gene Raymond had some recommendations after seeing the school where maybe some, some uh, painting was left out that would be more cohesive and, and match in certain areas. Um, things like uh, needs of teachers, um, some things we already own, what cabinets could be, could have locks on them. And we wanted to see how teachers felt about, you know, the millwork and where they wanted to have um, locking cabinets. So uh, the committee, well, the team, Gil Bain, Leftfield and Gene Raymond and staff, they worked, they worked through with Sean Satterfield, 
because a majority of the recommendations came from Sean and his staff. They worked through close to 84 items on uh, Wednesday, and so they'll continue to evaluate those. And we have um, uh, no challenges there of any significance, so that's really good. And then the other thing we'll be doing in the next couple of weeks is, um, you know, myself, Michelle, Dr. Bucky, Jason Silva, left field, will be putting together a comprehensive um, financial status update of where the project stands um, and what commitments we have outstanding. And David, David, while I was there today for my kids, I noticed um, because as is typical, this is not like, or we, this is not unique to us. You know, as you start to use things, things might break a little or whatever. So we'd had some issues on the playground. Um, there's one structure that every day when I pick up my kids, teachers would hand me a piece of like another piece today, but already Trip found out about it a day or two ago already today. He had someone on site when I was there, um, to look at it, to like get, I, I was really impressed with how quickly he did that turnaround. So I know it's been a discussion I've heard among parents. It's, it, it's not that there's anything particularly wrong. It's just this, this happens when you start using the building and he just put it on the punch list. And the key factor here is how quickly Gilbane is responding to these concerns. So yep. I think it's impressive. Wonderful. All right. Um, thank you, David. Uh, there's no correspondence. So that leads us up to the executive session part of our meeting. Um, just so that everybody knows after when I motion and we vote to go into executive session, um, the public will no longer be allowed to be in that um, in this part of the meeting. So everyone can um, feel free to leave the meeting before I have to kick you out because um, we have no intent to return to open session. <laughs> All right, so can I get a motion to meet in executive session pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Purpose 3, to discuss strategy with respect to litigation, specifically Boyd Perry versus Marblehead Public Schools at all, MCAD 21BEM 01943 EEOC 16C-2022-00020, because an open session may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the committee and the chair so declares. We will have no intent to return to open session. So moved. Megan moved. Second. second. Emily, second. Okay, I will ask for a roll call vote. Uh, Megan Taylor? Yes. Sarah Gold, yes. David Harris? Yes. Uh, sorry, people are changing. Um, Sarah Fox? Yes. And Emily Barron? Yes. All right, um, so we are now in executive session. Yeah, we'll have to boot people, so hold on two seconds, and I need to uh, turn us, and we will enter into executive session at 8.43. Yes, I'm going to turn us off of YouTube first. Can you run 